hear from Steve. Good morning, everyone. I think you can hear me. Yep, you're all good to go, Steve. Yeah, so I was getting a little nervous about the share screen thing, but it seems to be working well. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ross and Dwight for inviting me to be part of this. And I, I, I really appreciate all of Emily's uh, hard work trying to uh, herd us all in the right direction. It was also really fun to listen to Gary because, you know, I went to the University of Maryland composting school decades ago. And uh, it was a really nice uh, overview. Um, so I'm going to, this, this morning, what I'm going to do is tell you a story about how I got into uh, composting stable waste on my farm. And Ross uh, gives me great accolades for state of the art. I would debate that <laughs> this is not state of the art. My operation is not state of the art. And I purposely over the years have tried to come up with a on-farm composting system that was low budget because trying to uh, model something that fit my pocketbook and also that I could sell to other people in the community. So uh, just a little background. This is a picture of home. This is Edgewood Farm, uh, circa 1875. Uh, my family purchased this property. It's 150 acres right in Upper Marlboro, Prince George's County, where 12 miles as a crow flies from the nation's capital, less than two miles from the Beltway. It's a beautiful farm, very productive. Um, my family bought it in 1956, and I won't tell my age, but I've been there ever since, uh, and I'm 62. So what's kind of interesting with my story is the combination of things that I've learned and put together over the years. Um, this farm has very productive, uh, high quality soils. Uh, Collington with soils, very well drained, uh, fine sandy loam soils. Uh, I grew up, uh, we raised tobacco and had a large herd of cattle. Um, on a different farm that my father had, we raised about 2,000 head of hogs a year. We maintained a herd of about 2,000 head. I've got experience with corn, soybeans, wheat, hay, straw. Uh, used to raise some flowers for sale. Always uh, trying different uh, venues, you know, to make money. Then in 19, uh, early uh, 1980s, um, my wife and I, my wife Bonnie and I uh, started a boarding operation. Let me, let me go forward real quick. This is a combination of an equestrian uh, woman, that's my wife Bonnie, getting married to a farmer and working on, um, you know, my general farming operation at home and opening a uh, boarding stable. So we started operations in the early 80s. And, you know, when I grew up, my sister was into showing um, horses and she used to get me out of bed at three o'clock in the morning and hold the horse to get, so she could braid the horse and spend all day at the horse show. And I said, Man, oh man, I'm never going to do that. Don't ever say never because when I met Bonnie at the University of Maryland in the late 70s and we got married, she was into horses and we started our horse operation. So in 1986, I was fortunate enough to uh, come on board with the uh, Prince George's Soil Conservation District as a, a field engineer. So now I was taking the experiences that I had learned on the farm and uh, transferring that to uh, selling conservation to farmers uh, and landowners out in the countryside. So those combined experiences led me to um, where I am today composting. This is a very familiar scene this year, water, water, water everywhere, right? One of our biggest challenges uh, dealing with the landowners is how we handle the water, um, both from erosion, both from uh, mud, both from you know running across manure laden areas. And so it's a challenge. And 
and we try to work with folks and give them the best direction that we can. So my story begins with when we when we started boarding horses, it became evident very quickly that there's a lot of poop and there's a lot of stable waste was coming out of the horse and the bedding and the hay and straw or whatever else. So I, like many people at the time, I was just learning the fine art of um, soil conservation. Actually, when we started boarding, I wasn't involved with soil conservation. So I first started like many farmers do, many landowners. I, we had a manure spreader. We'd fill it up every day. When it got full, you go spread it on a field. And as common wisdom, it would be the closest field to the stable. Uh, problem with that was it caused a lot of field rutting, uh, a lot of ponding of water. Um, I started noticing after three or four years of this kind of manure management that my fields were, um, the yield, crop yield was diminishing. Um, I was also getting um, an influx of weeds and grasses that I did not that I did not want. This, of course, is not my tractor. I wish I had a tractor that nice and a spreader that's nice. These are my friends up at the USDA Feltville Research Center, but it shows the picture. So my phase one, I'm gonna go through four phases of how I got to where I am today. This is the same group. This is more of typical. This is um, courtesy of one of my supervisors, uh, Amy Posey. This is more of a typical spreader tractor combination that we'll find on a horse farm. So we did this for, for several years. And then I said, well, I've got to do something different because I'm damaging my field and I'm damaged, I'm, I'm losing uh, yield production and causing a real, tr real problem. By that time, I had started working in the soil conservation office and started learning more about uh, soil health practices and soil compaction and things, things to do and things not to do. So I moved to phase two of my compost education and that is the static manure pile. So we see this, this is not at my place. I, I never did take a picture of my mountain of manure, but anyway, this is typical that we see in the county. Um, you can see the static pile is close to the stable and every so often or not so often, uh, people will hire a contractor and they'll spread it or remove it or, or whatnot. Problem with the static pile is uh, the runoff, the leachate you can see at the bottom of this particular picture. Um, a lot of br uh, black brown leachate coming off the static pile is also uh, an anaerobic composting system, not the best system you want. It smells bad. Uh, Gary went over a lot of those uh, reasons why that happens. Um, it also is a great pile for weeds to take root. And if you're in production agriculture like I am, you, you don't want um, um, a pile of uh, rotting manure to to provide a uh, weed seed. Uh, it's a weed seed incubator, basically. So we see this as a, a very common practice in you know, around the county on horse farms. So as time went on, I've discovered the University of Maryland Better Composting School. Anybody interested in composting needs to attend this school. I've attended it twice uh, over the last 20 years, and each time it's it's always refreshing. Uh, you learn a lot of information. So this was my phase three. And um, so I learned about the interaction of composting, specifically uh, aerobic composting, what the process is and, and how to do it. And Gary mentioned the carbon nitrogen ratio. And I would have to say that the ratio uh, from the manure stable waste, like he said, it's not, we're not composting manure, we're composting uh, stable waste. And what I have found in my experience, we use um, sawdust as bedding. What I have found in my experience is that it's almost the perfect combination 
perhaps if I did a real test on it, it's, it's not ideal, but within one year with active turning of the piles, um, I can get good quality compost. So I played with different things. This really started getting me excited. I hired a contractor to dismantle my big mountain of static pile of manure. I had him put it in windrows. I just went to the edge of one field up on high ground and um, started my windrows. And that was one of the things that I learned in the Better Composting School. It seemed like for my operation, I wanted to do it on a budget, didn't have a lot of money, and I wanted it to fit in with my farm operation. So I said, you know, I think this windrow composting is for farm manure composting. Uh, a lot of farmers already have the equipment. You need a front end loader or a skid steer loader. And in this system, the thermophilic uh, microbes, they rule in this system if you keep the piles um, regularly turned so you get good, good um, regeneration of material and, and keep the heat up. You have much better control of oxygen and moisture. There's, I never have an odor issue. Um, and, it, and it comes up with a very uniform and consistent project, uh, product. Some people have asked me, have you ever had a compost fire? Yes, I did have a compost fire, but it was not caused by the composting process. It was caused by one of my hunters on his way out, flipped the cigarette butt into my compost pile. So the fire, the fire issue has never been a, a real issue. Um, one, one challenge with composting um, is weed suppression. Um, if, you're not, if you're not active in the process, of keeping those piles turned. In the summertime, you can get uh, weed growth on your pile. So you have to either break the pile down, get rid of the weeds. If they're not too big, you can work them back into the pile. The two most common um, weed problems I have is red root pigweed and common Bermuda grass, which we as farmers always called wire grass. Uh, wire grass will get into your pile. Now, if you turn it into the pile, it'll kill it. It'll heat it up and kill it. That red root pigweed seed must be like tomato seeds in sludge because it's, uh, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to kill. But those are really the only two that I really have problems with. Um, so I just took a, a few, um, scanned a few pages. These are some very common helpful uh, resources. This is called On-Farm on Composting Handbook. This is like the Bible of com uh, composting on the farm. It's very helpful, very useful. It's put out by the um, national, I forget what NRASC, but it's, it's part of um, New York's uh, Extension Service, Natural Resource Conservation Ag Engineering or something like that. So that's very useful. Um, handout. And also you have from the um, compost council, you have field guide to compost use and another public publication field guide to on-farm compost. So phase three led me to phase four. So instead of, we went from, remember, spreading it daily, weekly on the fields with a manure spreader, big problems. We went to a static pile. Still big problems, just different kind of problems. Went to better composting school, learned about the benefits of composting. And, uh, you know, it changed my whole mindset about instead of this being a waste and a problem, I, I, want, a, I want to make a product that is a value added to my overall farm operation. So I went out and bought this handy dandy little dump trailer. I'd already had a, a used skid steer loader that I had uh, purchase for the farm. So we began every day when we clean the stable out, we go up the ramp, dump it on the trailer. Since that time, I've built a little shed to back this in, keep it out of the weather, put two foot sides on it so we can get more manure on it. Then we take it down to the compost facility that's on the farm. We dump it in a pile. And every so often, I take my skid steer loader and um, form start my uh, compost windrows. Works really well. I've been doing that for, I don't know, 20 years now. Um, 
the nice thing about having that dump trailer is you can use it for other purposes. So there's a picture of my old skid steer loader. Once you get the material on site, then you bring your skid steer loader in and you start uh, forming your windrows. It's not rocket science. The key is you have to know when to be on the pile on the on the pad and when not to be on the pad. If it's raining like this kind of weather, I won't be on my pad for a week because it'll, I don't want to mess it up and make ruts in it. I'll choose a place on the side of my pad that's in a grassy area, dump my manure, and then push it over when it's uh, when it's dry. Like I say, this is a budget uh, composting operation, so a little common sense goes a long ways. You don't want to be uh, causing problems that uh, you know that you have to spend more money to fix. So there's a little bit of investment. You got to get the manure from the stable, the stable cleaning, you got to get that from point A to point B. How you do that either with um, a dump trailer or a flatbed trailer, however, you want to make it as easy as possible. One of the challenges running a horse operation, and we run into this all the time with producers, I don't have time to deal with that. So every everything you do and advise people, you want to try to maximize your uh, time efficiently so you want to come up with methods that are work smarter not harder so it takes a little bit of money to invest in the, the right equipment so as the as the uh, piles form i usually make a new pile it's about eight feet tall maybe six feet um, it's over my head i'm kind of short i'm only five eight so six to seven, eight feet tall. It's about 10 or 12 feet wide at the bottom. You can see the pad. You get a good visual of my pad to the left. It's just compacted soil. Probably doesn't meet any standard. John will be calling me up and sending me a fine after this meeting, but you know, that's just the way it is. <laughs> uh, so this is very important. Uh, Gary talked about a, a thermometer. This is a Rio temp they are about 150 bucks now. This is, they're really durable. I've had this one for a long, long time. And you can see the temperature. Um, you can see the background, the, the material. You see a lot of woody chips in there. There's some hay pieces. These piles will heat up to 150, 155 in about two days. Um, and so what I have done over the years, when I first started, I would keep very detailed records. Now I'm lazy and I've done it a long time. I just monitor the temperature. When it peaks, then I watch that until it goes down. If it peaks at 155, when it starts to go down to, gets down to about 140, I will get in there and turn the pile. And then that'll regenerate the heat. And in about six months, let's say a year, depending on the conditions, if it's really rainy like we're having now you can't really get in there and turn your piles on the flip side of that we've had some years where it's really dry drought condition then again i don't turn my piles because i don't want to dry it out one year in particular it was a very dry uh, drought year and it was so dry and we finally got ready to get some rain i actually took my piles and opened them up and let it rain on it and then put them back together and that regenerated the, the process. So after time, my finished windrow is probably three to four feet tall, six to eight feet wide. And it, it, it usually is about a 50% volume reduction. That's the same windrow um, probably 10 months after the first picture was taken. So the other thing about windrow composting is it fits in really well with the general farming operation um, you need some equipment and you need some area, but uh, most horse, horse operations can make this happen. There's a business opportunity there. We have a lot of um, no land operations. They don't have any choice but to haul it off. So there's opportunity for uh, folks. And I think we're probably gonna hear from some of them uh, about hauling uh, the manure off of their farm and taking it to a composting facility. Uh, usually it takes, this, this pile here is ready for sale. It's uh, between 12 and 18 months old. I have some sale, I have one big pile of compost that's 
Some of it's three to five years old, and it is just the most beautiful product you ever want to see. It's like black sand, and it just smells like Mother Earth, and, and people just really love it for their gardens. And to be honest with you, I've used this around my house on, on many occasions instead of wood mulch. It's, it makes a great mulch around your house for flower beds and things. You don't get that, uh, you know, at the end of the year where you have to clean all the nasty mulch out and put new stuff back. You just add more compost to it. And there are no flies, What, regardless of what people think. This compost, that uh, uh, mature material there, there is not a fly on it. Now, you'll have flies on the raw material coming from the stable, but not on that. And there is no, no smell to it at all. So we have two ways of selling the product, FOB, freight on board sales. You can see I have a customer there that brought his own roll off box, which makes it very handy. He just drops the box off, I load it up and he sends it away. He comes and picks it up. Or you can do on farm deliveries. Um, one fun thing is over the years I've made some money selling compost, I was able to buy some toys like, like the truck. So. Uh, it's, that's kind of fun and it gets back to my whole plan of on a budget and, you know, one step at a time. Um, so this is important. Uh, this is a, a larger view from the bottom looking up. Uh, my pad facility is, um, on about a two, maybe, maybe 3%, but it's pretty flat at the bottom. You can see the material at the right hand side is leaves, uh, leaf material and grass material. Um, we get a lot of leaf litter up by the old manor house and up by uh, my house. Uh, so we put all of that down there and let it compost on it on, on its own. Over the years, I've tried composting different products. I tried adding grass clippings to my manure. And just like Gary said, I even tried adding fertilizer to it. But that cost me money. I didn't want to spend any money. I was trying to use what I had. I did try using um, cattle manure. Didn't like it because it's heavy and it, it, it just wouldn't fluff up for me. So I've just stuck with straight, stable cleaning material. That has worked the absolute best. But best management practices to filter any runoff. Uh, one of the best practices you can do is manage your windrows. If you keep them flipped regularly, they'll absorb more moisture. You, you get very little um, leachate and runoff from them. And then at the very bottom of the uh, site, this is after a heavy rain this summer, I have a little stone crossing there for the road. And you can see, look how clean that water is. So I'm very pleased with that. Um, that's, that's very important because, you know, good water quality makes for some good fishing. <laughs> I don't know where this is taking, but that's one hell of a catfish. Anyway, and also proper management turns your waste into a pot of gold. You see the uh, rainbow coming right to my stable. And that's the end of my presentation. I hope you uh, got some good points out of it. It's, it's a very doable process. It's, uh, you can do it on a budget, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Oh, one, one other thing. Uh, a few years back, we had we hosted the top um, folks from the county. Uh, on the on my left hand side was our CAO. No, he was our DCAO, and on the right, she was our uh, CAO for the county. And uh, they just love coming out to the farm, and they love that uh, that nice uh, compost that's shown behind us. So, if you're going to get into the business on any large scale, it's good to work. I would suggest work closely with your soil conservation office and make sure you include your county folks because let them know that you're taking a, an environmental, a good environmental position and you're taking a waste product that, uh, lot, that a lot of people just throw away and turn it into a value added uh, product. I've actually uh, donated uh, some of my compost to the public schools for their um, different programs. Um, and that's been a big hit, parking planning as well. And so 
it's just a win-win situation. Refer list of reference materials and my contact information. Thanks so much, Steve. We have a few questions and also Gary, you'll probably uh, want to jump in on a little bit of these, you know, here, just a couple questions. Um, the first one is, um, Steve, when you say turn your windrows, you're using just your skid, skid, your skid steer loader, not like an actual compost turning machine, correct? Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's several, I have some additional slides here I'll go down. I always dreamed of having a um, self-propelled, <laughs> see if I can get to it, a self-propelled uh, compost turner, but they're like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 used. That doesn't go into my, um, you know, on a budget type thing. You can also get, this is what they use at the University of Maryland um, Research Farm. Uh, this was some years back. Um, that's their tractor and that's a compost turning machine. It's offset to the side. So it composts it, it adds water, I do believe, and it also rolls um, a geofabric over top of it. And it's on a concrete pad. And Gary can correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, and this is the self-propelled turner. This is like probably the smallest self-propelled turner you can buy. Um, and this was at, this is, I'm not sure they still have it. This is USDA Beltsville Research Center. The thing that I, this is important to point out is in my situation, you have to have about 15 foot of space between each windrow to give you room to back up, uh, uh, you know, back and forth with the fronty loader if you have it, or in my case, a skid steer loader. The next um, closest thing would be the tractor with the offset turn. You don't need as much space to get down the road. And then of course, with the um, self-propelled one, you really put more compost to a smaller area, but it's all, you know, budget. It's all economic uh, scale of economics, how much you can afford this. And what's interesting, you know, there are different pad designs. Uh, you can have concrete asphalt. This is actually lime stabilized soil that we designed um, with uh, USDA some years ago. And it worked okay, but they did have some weak spots in it that needed to repair over time. So there are different ways to do it. Great. And uh, Gary, uh, this one's kind of for you. Uh, so we're looking here at windrow systems and um, turning, whereas in your presentation, we kind of talked about maybe not turning as a good option and using blower aeration systems. So can you just kind of speak to that, like, um, the management of windrows and, and whether you need aeration or blowing systems along those lines. When you have a uh, forced aeration system, whether it's positive air or negative air, you still have to turn that once or twice because remember there's an edge to that pile when you form it and that does not compost if you don't turn it. So even a system that is... Um, formed once will generally be turned. So you don't get away from turning, you just don't have to do it as much. Now you can form your pile, put six inches of sawdust over it and leave it all alone and it will compost and you don't have to turn it at all. But that six inches of sawdust you have to then manage. So that's one of the di di differences. Um, you got to have energy, so you have an energy cost with it. That air is blowing. It, it takes a timer to do that because you put it on as like one minute on or two minutes on and then 20 to 30 or to even 40 minutes off. Well, those timers are a little sensitive and they keep taking maintenance, which is both money and time. I mean, you don't get away from it for free. It's, it's a different level of skill set that you have to develop it will make your compost operation go faster. You can get the composting done in 60 days and then set it aside to mature in a different location. And you can move stuff through, you can get a quicker, quicker throughput. Uh, again, you, you need a, um, a medium amount of space because you do have to get between the piles to build them and to tear them down but you only need room to get your compost or get your front end loader in and turned and backed and back up. 
again. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not the most time consuming or space consuming, but it's not the least either. Did that answer all the question or was there more to it? No, you got that one. Um, and then we'll follow up with this one. Um, are there good best management practices for treating leachate that's coming off of the manure pile? Don't create it in the first place, like Steve said. <laughs> take, take care of yeah. your pile. Um, a long, nice grassed area is a really good treatment method. That's what they use at USDA. They have a large field beneath their um, compost site. Water drains into that and it's got a long way to go. So it goes through um, continuous vegetation. Um, and then for you, uh, would, two uh, quick questions, two Steve, questions. and we're going to move on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Go ahead, Steve. I, I don't want to get too far over time. Yeah. I was just going to add to that uh, active manipulation of your windrows is so important. Um, I do like to run my windrows uh, lengthwise with the grade, uh, but a lot of times I will put a you can get free wood chips from Asplund or other tree dealers. You can take, if you have a hay operation or straw operation, and um, I will put it perpendicular to the row of windrows so that if you do have any leachate, it's, it's absorbed by that dry material. And then once you mix that up, you can add it to your compost pile. So it really is, it's pretty simple to me uh, to manage the leachate. Okay, and just quick question specific to your operation, Steve. There's a little three part three part question. Um, what are your rows sitting on? Do you sift your compost, and what price do you sell it for usually? <laughs> <laughs> so it is just compacted soil. I have done uh, unscientific tests, you know, over the years. I would do soil borings around the pile and test for for nitrates, all were, were very good, very clean. Um, my biggest challenge is, um, you know, not getting on the pad when the conditions are not right. Like three, we got three inches, three and a half inches of rain last night. I won't be on that pad for at least four or five days. And if I am on it, it'll be up at the upper end where it's not, um, you know, I, I don't want to try to make ruts and I don't want to try to make pads. Um, the sec what was the second part of it? Do you um, it was do you uh sift your yeah oh, sift no. your material? Well, you know, I was gonna buy and then what do you sell it for? <laughs> yes, I was gonna buy a um not a sifting machine, what do you call it? You where you would dump the compost in it, it would shake it and break it out, but there again it was fifteen thousand dollars for a very small unit. I don't sell that much stuff to, to you know, it, it wouldn't pay for itself. So what I've done over the years, once it's broken down, it really is just a very fine material. It will clump up some. Uh, I sold some to a, um, um, a local golf course. They love the material, but they have a very small compost spreader and the clumps kept plugging it up. So there's different techniques. You can take it and spread it out and run over it with the skid steer loader and try to break all the clumps up. But generally speaking, if, if it's not too wet, it's, um, it's very friable material with some clumps in it. Uh, the price is it's $20 for a scoop with my skid steer loader. That's three quarter yard bucket, which is $30 a yard. FOB, if you come to the farm, if it's delivered, then it's that price plus whatever cost to add on for a haul. Hey, thank you so much. I think we've got all the questions. There's some, some more questions about doing this on an even smaller scale, but we'll get into that um, later. We should have hopefully some time to address that for a small operation with maybe only a couple of horses. Um, but for now, I will go ahead and share Dr. Mess's presentation video, and then he's online for Q&A afterward. Um, but they did a really nice video for him. So let me um, go ahead and share that.
And if the other, uh, my co-hosts who give me a thumbs up if the sound comes through nicely, let me know, okay. We have sound. Great, thanks so much. Well, first of all, I want to say good morning and welcome to Brook Grove Farm. Uh, th this uh, farm has been in my wife and, I, and my possession since 1975. Uh, when we bought the farm, uh, we uh, were neophytes. Uh, the farm is uh, 203 acres, uh, half of it's pasture, half of it's woodland. And uh, it, as, as you well may know, it's in uh, Alney. Uh, not far away from Montgomery General Hospital, which I worked at for 40 years. When I first uh, uh, bought the farm, it was a cattle farm. Uh, we had Angus uh, cattle, a commercial herd, um, mostly about 30 to 35 head, and we did have a bull. Uh, as time went by, uh, people would approach me and w ask if anybody, if they could bring a horse here. And over the period of time, uh, the ratio of cows went down and the horses went up until about nine, the early 90s. It was a strictly a horse operation. We have about 42 horses on the farm. Uh, the, uh, they are boarded. Uh, some of them are mine, but most of them belong to other people. We have uh, a stable, we have an indoor riding arena, and outbuildings that we need to maintain the farm. Initially, we, as I mentioned, we had cattle on the farm, and uh, the vast majority of that manure was in the fields. And we would uh, harrow the fields at appropriate times, breaking up the manure, and we didn't have a large accumulation. Maybe a couple of times a year we would clean a, a stall that we kept a particular cow or so in, but uh, it was not a operation like we have now. And as I mentioned, we, uh, we, we started to have horses, and initially they too were all field boarded. But uh, we went on to uh, have horses in stalls, and that's when the collection of the manure uh, uh, on a regular basis uh, started. And um, initially, we would have the manure in a pile, and after a while, we would uh, try to spread it around with an old manure spreader. And uh, it was basically a lot of it, some of the manure was spread raw, others, uh, uh, as I mentioned, had some composting, but it, initially, I have to say, it was mainly raw manure we were putting on the fields. And it didn't take long to realize that uh, this produced a lot of weeds in the pastures that had previously been quite uh, free of the weeds. Uh, and in about this time, uh, the folks from Nutrient Management came by and we started working with them and they recommended the st stockpiling the manure before you put it out on the field. And we did that over a period of time. It was maybe 10 plus years ago, we um, had this uh, uh, pad, it's a 60 by 60 concrete pad put in, and, and it's right in wheelbarrow range of the stables. So the manure, uh, this, this process here uh, brought us to another level where we would have the manure in windrows and turn them at the appropriate time. And when they were fully composted, we would then take that out to the fields in a manure spreader. And it was a, a much cleaner operation. I have to give credit to the nutrient management uh, 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 people and the plan that they uh, uh, formulated. Uh, our, Amanda Lodwine was the woman who 
um, actually worked with my wife and I in uh, uh, setting up the uh, necessary uh, plans for stockpiling the manure and then measuring the uh, application of the manure uh, from the from the spreader this was uh, and uh, I can remember well Amanda doing that right in this field right up here uh, and and it got me into the nutrient management idea and the proper uh, way to handle not only the manure that the animals uh, produce, but also the way the uh, animals function on the farm and restriction into the streams. And uh, we got into building fences and essentially we fenced off all the streams that are on the farm. Uh, there is limited access uh, for passageway uh, but uh, the horses that now, the cattle before and the horses now are restricted and we're uh, quite restricted where they can go. And it's worked out well. I, I, uh, I think it's worked out the, the betterment of both the, the farm and, and uh, the bay. Uh, the, the way we uh, work the compost, uh, the first step is to, is on a daily basis the stalls are cleaned. And uh, the, there are 13 stalls in, in, in the barn here that uh, are cleaned every day and that fills anywhere from two to three wheelbarrows a day and they are taken out here and they uh, are placed on uh, the pad and uh, as this pad fills up we 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 uh, use a skid loader and pile it up uh, up to somewhere anywhere from four to six feet a pile will be there and uh, when it gets all the way down to the end here uh, it's time to turn it and this was turned last week this this pile right here and uh, can you see that uh, you can all right and um, we use this uh, the skid loader to do that it's a very efficient way to do it you can do it with a front end loader uh, I wouldn't want to be the person having to do it by hand but uh, you, you, I, I feel it is necessary to have some basic equipment to do that. Um, the, this row is turned when it's filled, so that may take, may take up to two months. And then it's turned over here to this row, and that will take uh, at least six weeks, probably more like eight weeks. And, uh, and then that is turned into uh, a third row, and if a fourth row is necessary, we can do that, usually by three rows. So we're looking at uh, a good four months to go by before it's ready to go out on the field. And uh, then to, to get it on the field, we take that uh, same skid loader, and I have a, a New Holland um, manure spreader, and we uh, load that up. And a row, a full row, when it's fully composted, will take about 11 to 12 loads on that. And what I have been doing, I've been taking it to an area uh, that is difficult for uh, commercial fertilizing to be spread. And we put it in that area, uh, maintaining 35 feet uh, uh, distancing from the stream itself. You can't, you can't go right up to the stream. And it's been effective in, in uh, fertilizing that air, the, this particular field. And if I have any left over after I've done the, that field, I'll put it nearby in, a, in, in a, another field. But uh, it's, it's, it's a process that uh, the, all the, all the um, manure, or actually compost, excuse me, is used on the farm. We don't take any off farm. 
except for a neighbor who may want to come by with a trash can and want to bring some home to their garden or flower garden or vegetable garden. And they've been very laudatory about the, uh, the um, strength, the, the composition, and how, it, how the uh, compost has worked in their gardens. Part of my nutrient, uh, as part of my nutrient management plan, uh, we're required to take samples of the compost on a yearly basis and soil samples where we are putting the uh, compost uh, on a three-year basis. And, um, and this is to remain in compliance with, with the nutrient management plan. Uh, I do want to give credit uh, to the Maryland Department of Agriculture and their cost share program for they helped me uh, put this in. Uh, they did the, uh, the majority of the expense was paid by that. And if you can look over beyond the composting pad, there's a dry lot there uh, for horses that cannot be on pasture. And that also was supported by the Maryland Department of Agriculture and their uh, grant. Okay, that was a great video that you guys put together. <laughs> um, we have a couple questions uh, for Dr. Mess. Dr. Mess, you'll have to unmute again. Um, and um, one question is about the thickness of your concrete pad. How thick is that concrete pad? Oh, hold on, you're still muted. Let me see if you can. Mute. There you go, I got you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, all right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to say it's six inches thick. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Six to eight inches in that area there. Uh, to comment about that, uh, the pad was engineered by uh, Paul, I'm blocking on his last name, uh, right now with the soil conservation. And he came down and we measured out the area and he set up the standards. And then I had a contractor come in and do it. And uh, um, I'm embarrassed, I can't think of Paul's last name, but that, that uh, maybe it will come to me later. Anyway, uh, six to eight inches. Great. And Paul, then Paul, Meyer, Paul Meyer. Yeah, Paul Meyer. <laughs> and um, can you talk a little bit about the typical volume of stall waste per horse as you take it to the rows? Well, this was this was calculated back uh, when we first started the, the nutrient management program, and it was felt that there was close to fifty pounds of of, uh, of uh, horse manure plus the um, so we we use uh, sawdust. And um, I was pleased to hear that sawdust was uh, favored, maybe not the most favorable, but it was favored. <laughs> and, uh, and that doesn't weigh a lot, except when the horses uh, pass their urine and then you have the heavier, you know, the sawdust from that. So you're looking at, I guess, you know, I'm uh, five, 600 pounds of, uh, of uh, waste. Uh, uh, per day. Thanks. And then the last question I see is, what do you do about runoff from your manure pad? What does it kind of look like around the manure pad there? Okay. It, it runs off in one direction. This particular direction is in a northerly direction. It's separated from a stream by uh, at least 
I'm going to say 300 feet. Uh, the um, end of the manure pad uh, has uh, grass that it uh, that that uh, filters out the runoff. And um, as far as a direct uh, flow uh, from the pad to the stream, there it, that does not exist. It's all absorbed in the the pasture beyond that. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for now. So it looks like um, I, I loved seeing your operation on the video. So thank you so much. Thank and uh, we'll, we'll move on to Katrina uh, Weinig from Meadowbrook Stable. Katrina, if you wanna go ahead and share your, uh, your screen. Everyone, I'm gonna get ready to do that here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Look. All right, can everybody see that all right? Looks good. good. All right, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Katrina Weinig. I'm executive director of Meadowbrook Stables in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, thank you so much to Ross for having me be part of this today. It's been a really interesting morning. And um, yeah, this is a topic I'm really excited to talk with you about. Um, and Meadowbrook's green mission uh, really is something that I think all of the, the staff and I are passionate about, and specifically about our manure management and composting practices. Uh, but I do wanna start by giving you a little bit of an overview of Meadowbrook Stables, um, the background on our facility and our business operations, because we are, um, as Ross said a bit earlier, we're a pretty unique uh, operation. And, there are a lot of factors that have really forced us to think innovatively about our manure management practices. Um, we are a full service hunter jumper facility located on only 11 acres of land in suburban Maryland, about a quarter mile north of the Washington DC border. We are literally in a suburban neighborhood. We have houses across the street. The uh, on one side of our property, the Rock Creek Hiker Biker Trail um, passes by with hundreds of people using that on a, on a nice weekend. Uh, we have 50 horses on these 11 acres. We have about 300 riders in our programs, <clears throat> ages six through adult. We have four riding rings and four small grass paddocks. Um, so it's, it's a real Rubik's cube of scheduling and operations. We have 11 full-time and up to 20 part-time staff. Um, and we are a nonprofit. We're governed by a volunteer board of directors on land that is uh, leased from Montgomery County Park. So we're basically a public-private partnership. Um, and one thing that I love to say, we were established in 1934. Um, at that point, as you can imagine, there were no houses in that area. Um, Connecticut Avenue was not even paved up that far at that point. And so we are at this point, one of the oldest and last remaining urban riding facilities in the United States. Just briefly um, to touch on our nonprofit mission um, because the sustainability and green um, mission is built into really everything we do. Um, and of course, that's what we're really talking about today. But again, a bit of background, uh, Meadowbrook was privately operated until the late 1990s. Uh, but at that point, um, the, the barn was falling into a bit of disrepair and it was purchased by a local philanthropist who himself had grown up riding there in the 1960s and 70s. And he attributed a lot of his business success um, to lessons about life and work that he learned at the barn working with horses. So he wanted Meadowbrook to have a broader focus and mission than just riding in horse shows. He really wanted us to focus on uh, character development among youth and um, the green and sustainable mission is something that the board and I added just uh, several years ago. So that's what we're gonna focus on here today. Um, but again, I just wanna mention um, before we get into the details of the sustainability measures, um, Meadowbrook is a really busy place. This just gives you some idea of the programs that we have running year round. And the reason I mention this um, is because I've had so many friends over the years, horse 
uh, farm owners um, and professionals say that they're, they're really just too busy to worry about being green. And I'm just here to say that it's possible. As, as anybody here on this who's spoken today knows, it takes some planning, it takes some upfront thinking, but it's certainly possible. And there are many, many good reasons um, to make those choices. So in Meadowbrook's case, um, why are we committed to this green mission? Well, again, we're in a suburban neighborhood and everything we do is on display all day long, every day. Um, it is, a, a, our commitment to sustainability is a sincere and, and value-driven commitment, but it's also pragmatic. Um, if we don't live up to the standards of our community, we, we will and we do frequently hear from them. Uh, we're also adjacent to Rock Creek, actually literally in the Rock Creek floodplain. So preventing nutrient runoff is critical. Um, our lease with uh, Montgomery Parks, the MNC PPC, also requires best management practices. <clears throat> um, but it also turns out that these things are cost effective. I'll get into that later, but we have saved literally hundreds of thousands of dollars by rethinking um, and updating our manure management practices. And lastly, I think anybody on this webinar today would agree, it's really the right thing to do. So specifically turning now to what this looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the Photos here show our purpose-built structure for handling manure and clean bedding. The structure is built on a hill um, with the lower side, which is shown in the top picture, uh, for our hauler to drop clean bedding and pick up full cans of manure. We have uh, 30 yard, uh, sorry, 30 foot dumpsters um, that are swapped out uh, five to six times a month. So again, 50 horses, five to six times a month. Bearing in mind also that we do not have a lot of grass turnout. Most of our horses are turned out in the sand riding rings. So all manure in the rings, as well as the paths, and of course the stalls is picked up within 24 hours. Um, so we, again, because of the stream, because of the neighborhood, um, we, this is just part of our daily practice. But in any case, it's also always picked up before the rings are watered and dragged. Um, and it's all stored in the 30 foot dumpster here. On the upper side, so the lower picture shows the upper side of this facility. It's where our staff um, basically dump the manure in. It just makes it an easy, easy way to do that. Um, and all manure is sent to Fry Agricultural Products, which is a Maryland state compost facility operator. Just a moment about Fry, um, because they have been great to work with. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't, they weren't available to speak today, but I, I wanted to just give you a bit of information about uh, this organization. Um, they're a family owned second generation business. They did start out in forestry and lum lumber, but they have really expanded their operations. Um, they sell bedding, hay, fencing, mulch, and of course now compost. Um, they are certified by the Maryland Department of Agriculture as a state compost facility operator. They serve in, in primarily Carroll, Frederick, Howard, and Montgomery counties all sizes of horse operations. I do think that we're one of their largest. Um, but basically, as you know, along the lines that have been described this morning, the compost sits, it's turned several times over nine to 12 months, goes through a grinder and then is sample tested for pH. They sell the compost in bulk, um, also through their garden center and to gardeners as well as um, larger uh, landscaper type operations. So I just want to touch a bit more also on how composting and manure fits into our larger sustainability goals. I'm not going to spend too long on this because it's not really the subject of today's topic, but I do really uh, believe that 
the horse facilities can look at many, many ways. Um, and this is one thing we've done to try and be very, think very broadly about what we're doing. Um, in particular, reducing uh, fresh water and power usage. So again, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I think that um, we can, uh, again, we have only 11 acres, but we use a tremendous amount of power and a tremendous amount of water to control dust in our rings. And there are ways that we can address all of these issues and, and minimize our um, environmental impact um, at all levels of operations. So the very last thing I do want to say, um, going back to the cost element here, because I sort of um, uh, flew past that. So we used to work with one company um, who supplied bedding and another company who picked up the full cans of our manure. I have no idea, honestly, what they did with that once they picked up the manure, but we were paying a total of about $100,000 a year for a combination of those two services. So now we work with one hall or fry egg, as I mentioned, who delivers our bedding and swaps out the clean can for the full can. And our total annual costs are now about $55,000. So it's about half of what we were paying before. And of course we know the manure is being well used to improve soil quality and provide nutrients for crops. Um, so it is really uh, going back to sort of why we do this um, it, it is more cost effective. It's, um, there's nothing, nothing not to like about this approach. So on the last screen here, I've just put up our contact information. I would be happy to talk with anyone, or if you would like to come by, um, and have a look at the structure we use for, um, storing and covering, um, the manure and the bedding, I'd be happy to show you that at some point too. So that's really all I have. I welcome anybody's questions and um, thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Thank you so much. You gave a really good picture of your operation there. Um, and then, so we can see, we have one question. Is it Frey or Fry? And I was looking at it, maybe Frey. Is it F-R-E-Y? Fry, F-R-Y-E. Okay. Yep. We'll have to take a look um, and see about that. We'll follow up on that um, in the comments. And then um, somebody else asked if just anyone knows of a program similar to Fry Manure Pickup in Anne Arundel County near Crofton area. Um, so if anyone listening wants to contribute in the chat, if there's a, a hauling type program that they use, feel free to put that there. Actually, can I jump in for a second? You're right. It is it is pronounced fry, but I I did misspell it. It is with you. Okay. Sorry Perfect. <laughs> no problem. Um, let's see. Yeah, fray. Okay, great. So it's fray. Uh, well, fry, but spelled F R E Y. So we've got that down. <laughs> no problem. They're, they're in Woodbine, Maryland, and their um, uh, composting uh, is on Woodville Road up near Liberty Town. Yeah, they're actually based in Mount Airy, but you're right, their right. stores in, their stores in Mount Airy. Yeah, that's right. Oh, and we do have one more question specific to you, um, Katrina, is about flooding on the land there. Someone who's been to the property before has said yeah. there used to be some flooding issues there. How do you handle that? Is it still so, an issue? So the flooding um, is, I wish I had an overhead map to show you, but the flooding is really, uh, for the most part, limited to the grass paddocks, which are right along uh, Rock Creek. So Rock Creek flows north-south, and the west side of the property has been left um, in, in grass and is our grass paddocks. To the extent there's flooding that is, um, uh, sort of active flooding as opposed to just rises and falls. Uh, it's, it's in that area. A couple of times we've had flooding that's sort of reached the parking pads, the, uh, but all of the important facilities, so that manure facility is well above the floodplain. Um, the riding rings, of course, get big puddles like everywhere else. With the new indoor arena, we're um, incorporating about 30,000 feet of bioswales um, and uh, stormwater management. 
So that's another way to address it. Great, thank you so much. Um, now uh, we'll go ahead and move on to um, Katie Voss. I have just um, some pictures and I'm gonna pull up the website to share while Katie's talking. So um, are you seeing the uh, Chance Land website, Katie? Yes. Great. Um, I just figured I'd, I'd scroll down if there's anywhere you wanna direct me to to show kind of your operation here. Um, and then I have your other pictures up ready whenever you're ready to talk about them. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Katie Voss and I own Chanceland Farm in Howard County. And um, we are a thoroughbred breeding farm. And we also, um, we breed, we raise, we sell and race thoroughbreds. And we have a um, training facility on the property. Um, the farm is in ag land ag preservation. Um, we've had, we, we developed the farm over 30 years ago and <clears throat> excuse me we usually have 50 to 70 horses on the property at any time um, we have a racetrack and those of you when you travel west on 70 we're on the south side of 70 just past the the truck way scales between 32 and 97 maybe you've seen chance land here you can see pictures of in, that's inside the training barn where we have we have the synthetic surface around the training barn and there's our racetrack. And the horse to the left is actually Lasitas, who's a very nice race horse that we have that's won some stake races. Um, we have, since we started the farm, um, our process for manure is, um, we well, we sell it to the mushroom companies, um, but we have, the farm is, divided by McKendry Road, which dead ends at I-70 in a little cul-de-sac. And back there next to 70 is where we keep our manure pit. And um, Emily has some pictures of the manure pit. And we okay. use muck wagons. Yeah. There's our muck wagon and there's the manure oh. pit. And so they muck into the muck wagons which drives straight through the barns, the center out of the barns, and then they, they're dump wagons. And we dump them. Um, so we have the, you know, it's a public road access to where our manure pit is. So it's very easy for the mushroom trucks or the, um, actually it's Fast Track Express. I think they're just a hauling company and they sell the manure to the mushroom companies, but it's easy access for them straight back the road and they can do a loop around and load right, you know, they have, a, a, I guess, a claw thing. They load straight into their trucks. They come in uh, four or five times a month and we get $180 a truckload. So um, last year, that was almost $9,000 a year, which is better than <laughs> other solutions for how to get rid of your manure. Um, and you can see we, that we don't have a runoff problem from that. It's not covered and it's picked up regularly. Um, I'm not sure what else, maybe if you all want to ask some questions about our operation. Let me uh, stop my screen sharing. Um, yeah, so how frequently do you um, have that manure picked up? Well, as I say, they, they come in four or five times a month. And usually, four or five times a month. yeah, usually it's a full truck. Sometimes they bring short trucks, <clears throat> but it's probably five times a month. And the, you know, the, okay. the, and then, uh, the amount of manure generated is going to vary depending on the time of the year, but it's the same driver that comes every time. He, he knows, he knows when to come. Um, and then some people are wondering how fast track um, pays your load or do they pay per load per pound? How does that work? They pay per load and, you know, occasionally they don't get a full load. So I assume they weigh it when they get back. 
because you see, I think I sent you all a printout of what that shows all the pickups. Yeah, do you want me to pull that up? I didn't know if you wanted me to show that right now or no, you can. I can share you that. Can, you can see where yeah. you can see the frequency with which they come. I just I just sent you for this year. Okay, let me share my screen. Yep. And you can see, you know, um, through whenever this was. <clears throat> see there's where the full mm -hmm. loads are, but then down there, if you scroll down, see a half a load. And that's actually a smaller truck that they use. And oh, okay. these look like they're all full loads. When I looked at last year's one, there were occasional ones that weren't for the full amount. So I think they weigh mm -hmm. the trucks when they get back. I mean, if the truck's full, it's full. Well, you can see the weight right there on it. So they pay by the truck. Yeah, load. that's really nice how they they summarize that, and especially for nutrient management planning purposes, you can kind of just get an idea of how much manure you're hauling off per year. Right. Very good. Um, and then let's see. And you mentioned that they come pick it up. They load it into their truck. Um, is that correct? How do they yeah. look? What does it look like when they load it? Is it? They have the, the truck has a, has a, I guess, a claw that it picks up the manure out of the thing and just puts it into itself. You know, it's all self-contained okay. in one vehicle. And they swing around, they can do a uh, U-turn there at the cul-de-sac, pull right next to the manure pit, load up their truck and drive out. Then they leave a slip in the mailbox on the way by. <laughs> right. And then someone asked if you bed on straw. Yes, we bed on and straw. And how many stalls do you have? Mm -hmm. Here, the Broomere barn has uh, 29 stalls and the training barn has 34. And uh, there are young horses and the mares, they all stay out pretty much. They, they come in, the weanlings and yearlings come in during the day, but then they're out at night. The racehorses, of course, are in the barn most of the time. Um, the training barn, and we have a 5 8 mile racetrack. And you know, at any given time, and like the training barn was, had 30 horses in it a few weeks ago, but then we sold all the yearlings or most of the yearlings. And the racehorses come and go and we keep some layups for other trainers. And so horses move in and out, but that's why I say there's usually between 50 and 70 horses on the farm at any given time. We've got like 17 weanlings, they're probably 25 mares on the farm. And right now, maybe you answered <laughs> 15 or 20 in the training barn. Great. You, you knocked out like five questions with that. So that was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, someone asked if you've explored the energy cost of handling your manure on site versus hauling it away to the mushroom farmers. Like what kind of helped you make that decision to haul away versus well, handling I'm getting on -site? paid and it doesn't it, it doesn't involve any extra expense to me. So therefore it's a, it's a plus plus, um, you know, anything else would require labor. Um, and instead of me spending money, getting rid of my, the, my expenses on my muck wagons, they did, we did finally have to rebuild them. I mean, these were built 30 years ago and we've had to rebuild them once. So that's our expense. Right. Um, do you know, or someone else can chime in, if the mushroom growers only want straw-based bedding or if they'll accept sawdust? They, I know they do not want sawdust or shavings. Um, that's a problem at the racetrack because they, the same company does take the straw bedding at the racetrack and they pay the tracks for it. And I have a string of horses at Laurel. So we see that if you want to use sawdust or shavings, you have to make your own arrangements. And there are companies that do, will pick up, they, as, as they do for Meadowbrook, they'll bring you a load of shavings and they'll take away your shavings, but you have to pay them. Hmm. Okay, let's see. And I have some people asking for contact info for Fast Track. I'll try to post that down in the chat in a moment. Um, let's see. Um, how much uh, straw do you usually have to buy per year for bedding for your operation? 
<laughs> I should have looked up that number, but it's <laughs> it's a lot. Um, sure it is. And, and as everybody that uses straw knows, the price of straw has gotten ridiculous. I think we pay more for straw than we do for hay, if you can wow. imagine. Um, I I don't have that number. It's it it would probably be in the fifty thousand range, maybe. Yeah, I bet it's it's definitely gone up. So. Um, and then do you happen to know if other race stables commonly use straw and haul off to mushroom growers? How widespread is this practice? Um, I'm not sure what other farms do. I mean, the racetrack does it. So, you know, that's an enormous amount. And that's quite a big operation at the racetrack. Uh, we have, you know, each barn has a covered dumpster. Um, you know, well, like I'm in a barn that has 60 stalls in it. So they're like four dumpsters for that barn. And they pick up regularly and they have sort of the same um, way our operation works because they go dump the cans in a big pile and then the then fast track comes in and picks up from their central place where they dump the cans. But they have their own, they, they pay the people that drive the, the Basic the trucks that pick up the dumpsters, take them down, dump them, bring them back, park them in front of the barn again. And so, and obviously Fast Track pays them. Fast Track then, Fast Track's out of Rising Sun. And then they sell to the, all the mushroom companies in Kennett Square, that area of Pennsylvania, where a lot of the mushroom companies are. Great. And again, I'll try to find the link in just a moment for Fast Track and post that in there so we can get yeah, you guys I think that I information. Think you, their, their phone number. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for that and I'll post it in the chat in just a moment. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. We're a few minutes ahead of schedule. Um, if, let's see if Eileen's ready, we can go ahead and pull her in. Let's see. I'm here, Emily, Unless, can you hear me? Okay, good, I can hear you. I was gonna say, I know you, you had some internet issues in your neighborhood, but I'm glad you're still in here, so. Thanks again, Katie, for your presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. All right, can you see my slides? 